start the Agricultural Rural Development Finance and Policy Committee. Today is March 9th, 2022, and the meeting will start at 3.12 p.m., and we have a quorum present. Today we have three bills, the first bill being Senate File 34, 3479. Senator Westrom, the bill is Rural Finance Authority Revolving Loan Account for Drought Relief Appropriation. Senator Westrom, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, this is the bill we uh, continued from last Wednesday uh, with the emergency drought relief for farmers uh, targeted to those with livestock uh, largely. Uh, we've got an amendment for this bill, and so, Mr. Chair, I think it would probably be best for discussion purposes and moving forward to uh, uh, move the A-1 amendment. So I, I would first move the bill for passage and being re-referred to the Finance Committee for the record. And thank you, uh, uh, Senator Westrom. I believe it's the A-6 amendment. Uh, members, I think the A-6 amendment is in your packet. Senator Westrom, uh, do you want to go through a little bit and touch on the A-6 amendment, and then we'll move it to get would, the bill uh, in order? Mr. Chair, I'll move the A-6 amendment first uh, for the record. Uh, Senator Westrom then, moves the A-6 amendment. All I, those in oh, favor? Mr. Mr. Chair, I can explain it. I just was making sure the record... Well, we'll go ahead and move it, and then you okay. can. All, right. All those in favor of the A6 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The amendment is passed. Senator Westrom, please for, go forward. Mr. Chair, uh, members, to the uh, bill as amended, it's still a $10 million appropriation as it was when it came to the committee. Um, members, the A1 or A6 amendment would uh, divide that money a little differently than we originally had in the first draft of the bill. Uh, first of all, it would take six and a half million dollars towards grants instead of five million dollars. Of that six and a half, five million would be uh, directed to livestock uh, producers across the state. Uh, 1.5 would be uh, uh, allowed for specialty crop production or livestock. And then uh, members a couple other priorities that have come about uh, with the avian flu uh, concerns that have uh, become more and more or greater and greater the past uh, week or two weeks. Uh, other potential uh, diseases out on the horizon. We would fund uh, the VDL at a million dollars. We heard that uh, a week or so ago in this committee, the need to uh, increase some of the equipment and the capacity and update some of those uh, pieces to have more uh, rapid response uh, capability. If you remember, uh, many, of the, many of those uh, orders of the equipment would not be necessarily able to be here in time for the avian flu, uh, but it's a, a timely reminder of uh, the need for having those labs up to date as much as we can. Uh, so that would uh, take, take um, uh, a million dollars of the appropriation of the 10 million. We do um, five, 500,000 for uh, emergency response to the Department of Agriculture uh, towards uh, additional response to uh, any emergency or pending em emergency that w we see coming, uh, avian flu being the, the imminent one right now. And, and we also give them a clarification language uh, to make sure that they can spend the f nearly $500,000 they currently have from the budget we passed last year uh, to, to be able to respond to uh, emergency uh, situations like this that uh, we're facing. And then um, uh, we also would, would uh, call out $500,000 towards uh, deer farmers, which are also livestock farmers in, the, in, in Minnesota members. But... Uh, We've heard from uh, those farmers uh, earlier in this committee and uh, some of the uh, costs of, of uh, keeping their animals uh, fed and uh, taken care of uh, while they may, maybe had their own types of uh, uh, urgent actions uh, or regulatory actions taken where they've uh, lost revenue and not been able to uh, uh, have the income on their farm just, just like uh, the drought farmers. So 500000 would be used for them uh, to also receive uh, up to $5,000 in the grants. And so, uh, members, uh, this language would also uh, expand from the about 10 counties that was in the original draft to uh, the map 
of the federal uh, USDA that uh, indicated uh, drought stricken counties, which would raise it up to up to about 67 counties, uh, uh, is, is what this language would also expand the eligibility to um, in this bill. And so, Mr. Chair, um, seems to me I'm forgetting one part of the, uh, the, the dollar amount, but uh, maybe uh, staff could uh, give me that if there's a piece I forgot. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Westrom. Who would like to go ahead with the balance of the finance? Mr. Chair and members, Senator Westrom, I think you hit all the points in the A6 amendment. Okay. Was there uh, nope. any other further clarifying questions? No, no, if I hit them all, that I was thinking I might have missed one, but I was just adding it up wrong in my head then, if, that, if I got it all. Very I, good. I believe you did. Thanks. Thanks. You got a oil light adding machine up there, Tori. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for your testifiers, Tori? Um, and Mr. Chair, uh, I think uh, Commissioner Peterson is here from the Ag Department. We did hear from testifiers last week, so um, Mr. Chair, we're, we are ready for testifiers or, or the committee discussion. Okay. Uh, Mr. Peterson, Commissioner Peterson, would you please come forward? Mr. Chair. Senator Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I just, for people who are following along, uh, I think we're working on getting paper copies of the amendment because not everybody has it in their packet and I don't think everybody had it uh, in the audience. So I just, I know staff are working to get it uh, and I want to make sure it's available for us. Thanks. You do not have one? Okay. We'll get some around the time. They're, they're publicly posted on the website as well as emailed to every committee member. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. They have it on email and they have it publicly posted. Okay, sounds good. Commissioner Peterson, welcome yep. to the uh, Ag and Rural Development Finance and Policy Committee. I think you've been here before and we'll have you here more again. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Senator Westrom, again, yeah, I haven't had a paper copy yet, so I've just been kind of looking at it on my phone, and I appreciate we've been kind of talking with Senator Westrom about uh, this, and I, I really appreciate Senator Westrom's work in trying to uh, find some common ground and different things on this. As I said, too, in my testimony last week, that what we put forward was could be scaled up or down, or and, and that's kind of what Senator Westrom's done. And so I, um, you know, we put out the uh, 10,000 and had it broke up in a different way. So not opposed to this. Uh, we prefer our language, but I, I you know, this is the, the way it's broke down. I think uh, may not get as much money to our specialty crop farmers, but again, we don't know until we start seeing the applications uh, how we need that. And so uh, one of the other, a couple other quick thoughts on this is, we and Senator Westrom and I talked about this is um, uh, using the United States Department of uh, Agriculture, um, uh, the counties that were designated. I think, and we have like a drought monitor. I think this might work. Our staff too is uh, kind of working on that, so I don't want that to be a big hang up because that's something we could, you know, fix on the in the floor or uh, another committee or in. Uh, um, uh, conference committee because I think the bills will line up a little differently um, but I just one thing I just want to you know continue to look uh, at as we uh, move on uh, and I'm just trying to read my notes here um, sorry kind of doing this a little bit uh, um, the maximum you know I think it gets to more farmers uh, it increases uh, the total amount to uh, uh, livestock farmers okay and then the other thing I just mentioned is yeah and I appreciate the uh, Senator trying to address some of the concerns we have right now with avian influenza and uh, and again trying to unlock some of the money that we do have and then also appropriating some of the dollars that we could use right now um, on that too. I'm not sure exactly uh, on the deer farming piece of it, again not opposed to it, but I just have to get some more information on that or a little clarifying on how that might work or what the loss or the revenue would be and our staff's kind of looking at that again kind of uh, as we go. And then uh, add one other comment. And again, our bill um, that uh, hopefully is uh, out, uh, you should get the jackets today and I apologize for the delay. It's been a long time uh, coming. We do tie our bill to the DNR 
uh, portion of that that also has some drought relief in it. So those are just some of my comments on it again. And I appreciate Senator Westrom uh, working on this to try to get the dollars out uh, as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, I think this will kind of be on some ongoing work. So sorry for my rambling uh, comments, but, uh, you know, as we're kind of working through this. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, Commissioner Peterson, and your comments are certainly on the record. Uh, Senator Wester. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Peterson, uh, jogging my memory a little. Uh, the, the million and a half extra that I was not having added up in my mind uh, was the portion of the RFA that we're paying back for the oh. low interest loans that uh, they have uh, started using or used last summer and fall. Uh, my understanding is that's about 1.3 or 1.4 million that they that they actually need. Uh, this would give a little bit extra on top of that, but uh, that's where the other million and a half is in this bill. But to that end, uh, what Mr. Commissioner Peterson talked about, and we talked about on the uh, earlier this week uh, when we uh, were discussing other this and other things, um, it, it might be helpful for our committee to hear from him or uh, his staff. How, how they would propose to move forward with an application on this because uh, in, the mic, in, the, in the blend of trying to uh, get this out quick, so farmers uh, needing feed bills to be paid or figuring out what they should be doing, um, the time is of the essence, but at the same time we also want to make sure we've got a, uh, a, a, a quick grant program that, that does have meaningful information. So. Uh, the right people are actually putting down information. So maybe Commissioner Peterson would have just a comment on that or some staff that uh, might give us some, some uh, insight or enlighten us how, how that process would work so we can try to um, also be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. Commissioner Peterson. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and uh, 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 Senator Westrom, yes, I, I'd like to phone a friend. We have uh, either Paul Huguenin or Ashley Bress from our grants department who could talk about how that might work for the applications as we kind of look at that. Um, I hope that they're on there and uh, that one of them could address that. Otherwise, I can take a stab at it. No, no, that's all right. No, no, okay. we're, we're prepared for it. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, this is Paul Huguenin. Welcome to the Ag Committee, sir, and if you would like to state your name and who you're with for the record and then proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Paul Huguenin. I'm the Director of the Ag Marketing and Development Division at the Department of Agriculture. Um, in terms of process, um, I think the important thing is that we would rely on, on what we learned handling uh, some of the COVID relief funds. Um, as this committee knows, we handled several rapid relief grant programs, so we would use that as a model uh, you know, and basically, you know, as the commissioner has emphasized, the goal here would be to, to be able to turn this around as quickly as possible so that farmers can get those checks and get relief as quickly as possible. Um, so from final passage, basically, obviously, we need to finalize an application. Our, our intent would be to um, encourage farmers to apply electronically as much as possible in the interest of time. So uh, likely that would be an email application where they could attach, uh, attach the application and any supporting documents. Um, to get them into the state system so that we can cut a check, we would need to have farmers send in a W-9. Uh, we can collect that electronically as well. We do anticipate the need though to, to offer farmers a, a, a purely paper option as well. I mean, we know farm, so many farmers are very electronically sophisticated, but, but there are still some we anticipate would prefer a paper model. Um, so, I mean, that's just a quick kind of glance at how we would, how we would approach this once this bill uh, reaches final passage. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Peterson, you No, sir. Mr. Chair, uh, that, that covers it for, uh, for our end. If uh, members have committee, or committee members have questions or any discussion, uh, that's, that's, what, that's all we have. Thank you, Senator Westrom. Members, uh, questions? <coughs> Senator Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, looking at the amendment and, and the bill, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm just wondering if there is a requirement uh, for a report to come back to the Ag Committee of how these funds uh, were dispersed. Once they've been uh, decided 
and voted upon and finance, goes through finance and we get it to the governor. Uh, is there a report being required here so that we know exactly how these funds were used and that we feel comfortable about what we've done? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Anderson, uh, that's a good question. Um, as a matter of course, we are, I don't recall that we're requiring any uh, report in this bill, but uh, certainly something we could talk about um, if, if there's a standard report that would be issued anyways, or else we could maybe add language. Uh, I guess I'm looking to staff for either guidance or uh, other committee members. Uh, certainly might be a thought, and maybe the commissioner has a comment or thought on that as well. Senator Westrom, I believe under the emergency count there is a required report, but that would be the only report that's going to be in place at this point in time. Okay. Senator Anderson, follow up? No, Mr. Chair, if that's uh, already required of these funds uh, that we, uh, in the next uh, session or next uh, legislative session, that we get a report back, that would be great. I look forward to the see how uh, many people uh, applied and how many were given out and how we've utilized all the funds. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Friends. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Westrom, for bringing this forward. Uh, we've just seen the A6 Amendment. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, can, Commissioner, can you talk about the $6.5 million versus $10 million? Um, just asking, not suggesting that we don't move the bill along, just um, as we look at the, the need I think the farmers in some of our districts are going to notice the, that amount and, and wonder whether there's any significance or where we're headed with that. Commissioner Peterson. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Friends, too, and just trying to be clear because I, now I lost the bill, too, but um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I don't have the paper copy of the bill. But, Mr. Uh, Chair, Mr. Maybe the pages could bring a paper Because I just want to be clear. Uh, is your total overall package is 6 .5. what? 6.5, okay. 10 total. 10 total, with right, the with the RFA. So basically we're putting more in the grants and less in the RFA. And the senator is uh, correct that that would uh, uh, help uh, pad our RFA. It wouldn't give us much of a cushion. The, the thing we're concerned about is we've done, as the senator said, I think it's $1.3 million in loans. We have quite a few others, like in the queue right now, we've gotten like 30 or 40 calls. We're just not sure where that's gonna come or where that's gonna hit. Um, you know, so there's a possibility if we don't backfill um, or put some more money in the RFA, there may be people that aren't able to get those uh, loans if we were able to run, or we use it for other, that revolving loan account is used for other things like farm restructure loans. Luckily right now it's, uh, you know, uh, we're not doing as many restructures, but there are other loans that use that account too. And so we could run short, but we could maybe address that again next year. Uh, you know, this might be enough to get us through to the next year. So uh, it doesn't give us a lot of uh, maybe enough. When we, we put the $5 million uh, figure together with um, uh, advice from our uh, Rural Finance Authority, um, but that being said, we could go with a smaller amount, uh, you know, and we'd be able to work on it for now and, and satisfy the loans, but, you know, not knowing what the rest of the year will bring. Senator, or Commissioner uh, Peterson, we're trying to find, trying to get you a copy <laughs> of the bill here shortly. Right. So, Senator okay. Friends, follow up? No, but thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Friends. Members, other questions? Members, any other questions or discussion? Senator Eakin. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Westrom. Thank you so much for, for bringing the bill forward. Uh, this is critically important. And, uh, you know, I think about how things have changed since I was growing up with all the, the livestock uh, agriculture that we had and how, how little we have today. And we've been moving in the wrong direction. And uh, given the fact that we've been losing so many uh, livestock farmers and uh, the number of dairy farmers alone that's been lost in the last uh, last few months is incredible, and and uh, and so we need to do all we can to save the ones that are still there. So I appreciate you bringing this forward, and hope that we can move this along uh, as quickly as can we can through the conference committee process, and and get the help out as quickly as possible. So, but uh, thank you for bringing it forward, and I encourage everybody to to support it. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Kent. Members, any other discussion or any other questions? Members, any further discussion? Seeing yep, none, thanks. Senator Wester, any final comments on Senate File 3479? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, just briefly, uh, 
uh, thank you for uh, your support. And uh, we've tried to uh, balance uh, our approach uh, with $10 million covering uh, multiple fronts that we've heard, uh, drought relief being the big primary uh, concern. Uh, this puts actually more money into grants than the original bill, uh, trying to, uh, to meet all the needs and, uh, uh, as, as best as we can uh, spread it around. I just share a story with a dairy, dairy farmer in my district that uh, I uh, had the opportunity to visit with them at the, one of the uh, conferences, Agri-Growth, I think it was a few weeks ago. And just, just to give you a kind of a, a, of a picture of what's going on on the farm, and uh, in their case, uh, they're, they're just going week to week to find f enough feed stock for their dairy cattle. Uh, they're, for the first time ever, using wet beet pulp out of Renville, Minnesota, uh, to feed and mix into their TMR, their, 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 ra their uh, daily ration for cattle. Uh, it's actually going pretty well, they said, for uh, them trying it out. But they have to travel uh, that distance now to bring that, that feed in every week. Every Wednesday they go down and get another load. They have to feed it up really quick because it's wet or it will we'll spoil. And so uh, those are the types of stories that we're hearing for the farmers that are just every week trying to figure out a way to make the forage last. And I grew up on a dairy farm. I know how it was. Uh, April, May came around. You just couldn't get that alfalfa to grow fast enough. Sometimes you'd go out and cut it a little early, even just around around the field to just get a week's supply of, of forage till you could get that first crop of alfalfa in. And uh, our farmers haven't had to start doing that in May. They've had to do it in November, December, January because of the sh forage that they uh, did not get in the crop and in the pastures last fall or summer summer and fall. And so this is a, not going to be by any means replacing all of the costs that they've had, but a shot in the arm, uh, help with a feed bill that's getting late or, or old, extra costs in bringing that feed into their farm, going to pick it up further away. And uh, you know they've got property taxes due May 15th that, that they probably are trying to figure out how they're going to pay for. So whatever it is, it's going to help them with that uh, unexpected cost because of the drought we had last year and be a partial uh, uh, replacement, but a shot in the arm uh, from, from uh, the state of Minnesota through the Department of Agriculture to uh, help them sustain till they get to the, to the next season, the growing season. And uh, uh, that's, that's what this proposal uh, will do. And I think uh, I'd urge your support, appreciate your, your support. Well, thank you, Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom moves that Senate File 3479 be passed and re-referred to the Finance Committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Senator Westrom, if you would like to change places. Senator Dames, uh, Senator Dames uh, would move uh, Senate File 35, 3711 for consideration and be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Uh, Senator Dames, uh, why don't you tell us about your bill and then uh, we've got some testifiers. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, today we have Senate File 3711 and this is a bill in relation to appropriation for the Evergreen Agricultural Initiative at the University of Minnesota. This is a 20 million appropriation in fiscal year 2023 to be appropriated from the general funds of the Commission of Agriculture for grants to the Board of Regents, the University of Minnesota to fund for evergreen initiatives and protects the state's natural resources while increasing efficiency, profitability and productivity of Minnesota farmers by incorporating perennial and winter annual crops into existing agricultural practices. 
practices. Of this amount, five million is for equipment and physical infrastructure to support breeding and agronomic activities necessary to develop perennial and winter annual crops. This is a one-time appropriation. is available until June 30th, uh, 2028. Members, uh, thank you for allowing this bill to become for your committee uh, today. Uh, this is a very important bill. We're seeing a lot of changes in agriculture, and one of those changes is the cover crops. And so today we have two testifiers here. And Mr. Chair, if you would welcome uh, Dr. Weiss. Uh, we'll start with the testimony from Dr. Weiss. Thank you, uh, Senator Dames. Uh, Dr. Weiss, so welcome to our committee. Identify yourself for the record, and uh, you may proceed. Mr. Chair, members, I'm <clears throat> Don Weiss. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota, and I'm the lead scientist for uh, the Forever Green uh, initiative that's been under development at the university probably for the last 25 years. So I would like to proceed, if I may, uh, utilizing a PowerPoint uh, presentation. And what I'd like to do today is give you an overview of the Forever Green initiative and give you an idea as to where previous investments, state investments have made and where this uh, proposed state investment uh, would be utilized to advance uh, the, Forever Green, uh, the, the, the Forever Green initiative. So being very straightforward, the Forever Green initiative is really designed to develop the next generation of winter annual and perennial crops. And just to remind you, I represent the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics that created all <laughs> of the crops that we have on the landscape today. Well, hybrid corn, soybeans, wheat, barley, oats. So for me, as a member of that department, this is a con just a continuation of the, of the development of the next generation of crops for the farmers and, and uh, uh, citizen, uh, citizens of the state of, of Minnesota. What's unique about this set of new crops, they're designed to produce a continuous living cover to protect the soil and water resources of the state, but do it with an economic pull, right? So basically it's designed to make the agriculture system more profitable than it is today, and at the same time, produce that landscape protection. Clean water, healthy soils. So this is the grand challenge that we've taken on and are moving forward basically over the last 20, uh, 25 years. So new food products, new economic opportunities, plus uh, that landscape protection. And let me just give you an idea of where we're at today. This is a satellite shot of the greenness on the landscape over time. We're soon, I hope, coming into April, and uh, we'll see a little green on the landscape, but this satellite shot suggests that there is a very large brown spot on that landscape across the corn and soybean region. Going into May, it's still there. Getting into June, when corn is in the five leaf stage, it's starting to cover, right? And then as you go into July, it's green. We are really fixing carbon. <laughs> and the growth and development of the corn and soybeans that are part of that landscape. But, by the middle of September, going into October, it's brown again, right? So if you count the months, we have living plants, active roots in the soil for about three months out of 12, right? So this program is designed to figure out how, to, from an economic perspective, to cover that land, cover that brown with an economic pull, right? That's, that is the basis of the work that we're doing. Right? But that the key is developing new crops and new cropping systems that are viable in the marketplace. And you'll hear from some other testifiers today that, that are the end users turning it into viable products in the marketplace. So just to give you a visual of it, <laughs> right? Here's Kearns of the first perennial grain in the world that we released as compared to an open soil that you just saw in terms of the brown period in the fall. Right, so it's being positioned now for wellhead protection, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later on, and for planting in buffer strips, to make buffer strips profitable, right? Just as two, as two examples. The other big push that we have in the program is to develop a new type of cover crop, a cover crop that fits in the corn and soybean rotation, 
protects that, the, the, the water and the soil, but produces a crop that has a marketplace, right? So it does not deplace, displace corn and soybeans. It fits into that system to fill the brown in the fall and the brown in the spring, right? To hold those nutrients, we all know the value of nitrate and hydrogen, right? <laughs> It's well over 50, 50 cents a pound, right? You can look at it as a pollutant, but it's also, it has economic value to hold it into the system and provide uh, nutrients to these, these new type of cover crops. So these Mr. new Weiss. evergreen crops Mr. have Weiss. to have, go ahead. Just a question on, yep. uh, on that. So when you, what, what types of things might we, what might you be thinking of? Uh, you said between the rows, but something uh, that would be growing in the fall, uh, probably October time frame when the corn's been harvested so it, it can get that sunshine again, or something that would start in the fall and then continue in the spring and be harvested before the corn would go back in again? Or just ex explain that a little bit more. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll show it visually if, 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 and, if I could just wait a second. Yep, it'll that's come, fine. It'll and then come up and I'll show what it looks like. This, uh, when you talk new products, uh, the cereal that we've been handed out, uh, edible, I hope it's edible. I've already been eating it. So, uh, <laughs> But well, maybe you want to talk about that are, just briefly as well. Yes, that will be uh, part of it. That will be... Mr. Chair, that will be part of the story that we're presenting today. All right, thank you. So these new crops provide new supplies of oil for food, diesel fuel, jet fuel, fiber, protein, and a wide range of other, of other products. So the new economic opportunities that are provided by this investment is high value food, feed, and energy ingredients, green marketing, ecosystem services, reduction in greenhouse gases, innovative health, uh, healthy food products, and as a rural kid, new economic opportunities for farmers in rural communities. I think that's key to what we're presenting to you today. So, not only economic opportunities, but these environmental protections. Protection of rural water supplies, clean water in general, nutrient management, pollinator habitats, carbon sequestration, soil protection, and soil health. Just to give you an example of the things that we're focused on. Okay, but how do we get there? So this is what we are so very proud of and we are unique in the United States of America. We've put these 16 crop development platforms together, all the way from basic breeding, genomics, agronomics, food science, commercialization and supply chain development. So the basic science is tied all the way through to commercialization. And you'll hear those stories presented to you today. And these are real. We have 55 people at the University of Minnesota that are working on this full array of science and application of that technology. All right? It's unique in the country. So these are the crops that we're working on. All right, intermediate wheatgrass is the first perennial grain in the world. I'll just use that as the example of one of the perennial crops. The winter annuals, pennycress, camelina, those are the oilseed crops. Pennycress is, has been domesticated in the same way as the Canadian de domesticated rape seed into canola. We've done exactly the same thing with pennycress into a winter hardy new oilseed crop that fits into that corn and soybean rotation, all right? And then we have a couple others that we'll just mention, hazelnuts. The global demand for hazelnuts is very high. Great interest from a wide range of food companies. We are making progress in putting some of that germplasm into the marketplace with enterprises being de developed around it. Just a heads up, we have made great progress over the last number of years. We have products in the marketplace from General Mills, uh, a Perennial Pantry, a local uh, 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 company, Patagonia, and a wide range of other use users, including breweries. <laughs> Bang Brewery here in the Twin Cities, as well as others across the, uh, the Midwest and really across the, uh, the country. So we've moved from basic research to real products in the marketplace. So this is how I like to look at it in terms of the 
as a research scientist, everyone looks at research as a dead end in some cases. We are not a dead end. This program is designed to take the research directly to the field and to the table as I just described to you. Very, very nutritious, very good tasting food products, right? And others will testify and to that in greater detail than I can give it to you today. So to date, a lot of the funding, base funding for this work has come from Clean Water Legacy in the range of maybe $8 million over eight years, 10 years, right? What have we done with that? We've organized these 16 crop development platforms, and for every million dollars you have given us, the state has given us, we've been able to bring into the state of Minnesota another five million. So we've taken that $10 million funding from Clean Water Legacy and turn it into 50 million. Industry, foundations, USDA, and beyond. So the investment that we, you have made in us, or the state of Minnesota has made in us, we've increased it fivefold. And, and I certainly would be very happy to share that data with you if, you if you'd like to see it. But we've also been successful in new products. Minnesota Clearwater, the first perennial grain in the world. It's now in the marketplace. It came out of our, out of our program. The first winter barley that really survives <laughs> here in Minnesota, right? Uh, first winter hardy hairy vetch as a cover crop going in, in the, in the, into the system. Six new hazelnut lines that are going on their way to commercialization. Just to give you, we could go on and I don't want to do that. <laughs> So I'm going to give you just a couple of very fast examples, if I may, Mr. Chairman. I want to show you an example that has, is in the news all the time, right? But I don't want to get concentrated. There's 16 others. But this, let me show you a, and give you a little background on the perennial crop, intermediate wheatgrass, Kernza, and then the two new oilseed crops. So intermediate wheatgrass was introduced in the United States as a forage. We're basically just domesticating it as a perennial grain. But you don't lose the grazing. <laughs> you don't uh, lose the quality forage product that comes off of this. So it's a dual use. Everyone force, focuses on that grain, but it still has high level productivity of forage. So in a year like we just went through, you got the grain, and those farmers are also marketing a high quality forage off of that landscape, as well as grazing it. This is why it's exciting. And this is why it's so interesting to, for wellhead protection. It has a very deep root as compared to uh, winter wheat next to it, right? <laughs> so there's also this interest, does it sequester carbon? We're not sure yet, right, whether it does sequester carbon in a way that will stabilize that carbon uh, in, in the soil. What's the focus? Why intermediate wheatgrass? Relatively large seed to start with, large amount of biomass, has high level of disease resistance, it can be grazed, and because of the deep root, we like the idea of positioning it for wellhead protection across rural Minnesota. And it tastes good. <laughs> Right, as it moves into, into, uh, into food products. Just very briefly, the breeding program is connected to our food scientists. They work in tandem. I won't go through that in detail, but all the characteristics that are the breeders are putting forward are being done in tandem with the food science department to move products that have value, and then the food science group then work with the General Mills, the Kellogg's, those types of companies in the world. You get the idea basic science connected all the way through to, to, the end, to the end uses. So domestication, what do you need to do? This very rapidly, reduce seed, seed shatter, weeds shatter, right? So domestication trait, keep the seed on the stems for harvest, right? Fresh ability, reduce the hulls and increase seed size, and that's what we're trying to show with the package that's been a center sent around you, to you today is to get an idea of what the seed that's coming out of this, 
this program actually look like and gives the idea, yeah, it's real. <laughs> There's real seed, real food products coming out of this program. So the big deal, if we release Minnesota Clearwater, the first perennial grain in the world, and there'll be a new variety released in two years. It's under evaluation now. It's out for seed increase uh, as, we, as we speak. All right, agronomics has to go along with it. So you can have the plant, but you have to figure out how to grow it, right? So we have a team that's working on that as well. Nitrogen rates, row spacing, and all of those types of things that we could go into some detail. Now this is what's exciting. This is why folks that are dealing with wellhead protection, nitrate in, in well waters in our rural communities, this is what they find exciting. The top line is corn looking at the soil nitrate nitrogen below it over time. Next one uh, is switchgrass, a native grass, right? It's a cool, it's a warm season grass. It doesn't grow early in spring, so it's, there's some leakage in that. But look at Kernza. Basically, no nitrogen moves through it. And we now have evidence that those deep roots can actually bring some of the nitrogen back up. That's part of the study, right? There's evidence that that may in fact be the case. No nitrogen going down through the system, and it may be able to bring some of the nitrate nitrogen back up. Not only that, but it produces a marketable grain <laughs> in those environments, right? And just again, just to tie it to the food that, um, that, that you've been, been served. I just want to say something very briefly about, I don't want to take up all the time here, uh, on pennycress and, and camelina, the two oil, oil seed crops. These are winter hardy. You can plant them after corn. They will survive the winter even when they're really small. And I just got pictures from the, from the campus. It's growing already this spring. As that snow melts, those plants are there putting down roots, holding the soil, and keeping the nutrients in place, right? And I'll show you what that looks like. So what are we doing? What are the basic science? Again, reduce shatter. <laughs> Produce a product like the Canadians did. They went from rapeseed to canola. All right, you, high uricic acid has to be bred out, right? Uricic acid has to be bred out so it can be moved into, into the marketplace. We've done that in six years. It took the Canadians three decades because the genomics technology that we currently have, we can rapidly advance some of these new crops and get them into the marketplace, not in someone's lifetime, <laughs> but in less than a decade. That's the opportunity that we have with the, with the technology, genomics technologies that, that are available. So, Mr. Chair, the, the system that you were asking about, I now have up uh, on, the, on the slide, basically showing shows the camelina and pennycress established in corn. We come back in the spring and plant soybeans no-till into the camelina and pennycress, and then you harvest the pennycress and camelina over the top. This is what it looks like. So seed the camelina and pennycress in the corn uh, in April 18th. This is the way it looks, nice green cover. You come in at that time until about May 10th, plant soybeans no-till into that system, and then harvest the pentecrest or camelina over the top in a classical relay system, right? So we didn't invent the relay system. This is a type of production that you're gonna find around the world that, that fits in. You get the idea. You see with the winter annual and the summer annual, you have a continuous living cover. That soil is protected. The nitrate nitrogen that's left is being picked up by the pentacrest and camelina, right? There's one other thing I want to show you. You can see how the soybeans are planted in and how they survive within the camelina and, and, uh, and, and pentacrest in that middle slide. You see the soybeans in the row, right? Well, this is the other exciting part like with the uh, uh, Kernza. 
This system reduces nitrate, move, nitrate movement under these, that system by about 90%. All right. Continuous living cover protects the soil and reduces the nitrate nitrogen because it uses it to produce a, a new grain product that has profit, profits for, uh, for, for the farmer. Some of you know I'm a weed scientist. <laughs> Worked on herbicide mode of action for years of my life. Discovered the mode of action of several herbicide families. We need a new method of weed control. Look at that lower left, lower right slide. That is camelina without a herbicide applied. Look outside of that in terms of the weeds that are growing where it wasn't covered. We think that these systems can reduce herbicide inputs by two-thirds, reducing the selection pressure to reduce herbicide-resistant uh, herbicide resistant weeds. With this investment, you're going to get more of that. In the next five years, if it's spent over that period of time, we will be able to improve the varieties that we are currently re releasing, release additional varieties, and come into place with our fully domesticated Pentecrest lines. It would have great value. And I should just tell you, next week there's going to be a big announcement in terms of Covercrest is one of our companies that we partner with. There's going to be an announcement that there is going to be a full supply chain all the way to Exxon for all of the Pentecrest that can be produced in the United States moving it into jet fuel. Okay, it took us a while to get there. But as we move these, this plant material into the marketplace, that supply chain and the, 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 will be announced within the next 10 days to two weeks. And I'll make sure you see a copy of that announcement, right? So the market is coming, it's being developed, and it will have, Minnesota farmers will have access to that market. Right. I can't mention the names of those companies. I, don't, I want to wait until they actually announce it. <laughs> I'm tempted, though. <laughs> Just one more. You have, we've laid out in detail for conversation, debate, and discussion where we would intend to invest these dollars. And all of these dollars that come from the state of Minnesota, as it comes through our program, go out on competitive bids within these teams. With a review team that assesses the science, assesses the needs, and then the dean along with uh, uh, the commissioner and his team decide how that money uh, moves, into, it moves into these programs. But these are just my projections based on my knowledge of where I think the dollars should go. That doesn't mean that's where they're actually going to go. It would be in a competitive way. So basically, graduate students get the funding. And we love to put graduate students in front of We don't have them with us today. Uh, but that's where a lot of the investment goes, investing in the next generation of agriculture scientists for the state of Minnesota. Right? So it gives you an idea of the number. Chair. Thank you, um, Mr. Weiss. Uh, uh, very, very, very uh, impressive background and and, uh, and, and foreshadowing of, of what what opportunities are there. So, uh, members, any questions? So we do have uh, six more testifiers, three, two more on this bill, and then four on the next bill. So I just want to try to make sure we allocate time. Um, but uh, thank you, thank question. you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you all have this PowerPoint. There's a few more slides, but uh, you can go through. And uh, Thank you. Dr. Wise, uh, the, the, the cereal in front of us, is that for another testifier or is that something? Well, Mr. Chair. I don't want to, I don't want to spoil anybody else's testimony, so. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I, I, for me, these are things that are all tied together today. Yeah. So to me, it's one, one conversation. There's two bills, but for me, it's one conversation showing the connection from the basic science all the way through the commercialization part, so. Yeah. Senator Goggin. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, thank you. If I could just ask one question. Uh, Dr. Wise, you said hazelnut is very popular. 
Could you expand on that a little bit, why it's so popular and what it's... Well, it tastes good. Dr. Weiss. The chair. <laughs> the chair. It tastes good. Well, I have hazelnut coffee right here. So. <laughs> yeah. I rest my case. <laughs> uh, is that, is that a growing popular uh, food substance, uh, Mr. Dr. Weiss? Mr. Chair, yeah, in, in Europe, it's the number one uh, nut and it's moving and gaining uh, a lot of market demand here in, in, in the United States as, uh, as and, well. And, and does it grow well in Minnesota? It's native to Minnesota. Native, okay. Other We're questions, members? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Dr. Weiss, uh, I remember on the dairy farm growing up that on the cow lane where we cows would go down to a pasture and come back up, we had hazelnuts growing on either side of the cow lane, and uh, I didn't realize that there was such a, a demand coming this far future that this would be something that we would be looking at as a, a grain nut, or I shouldn't say grain, but a nut that would be uh, for agricultural use and beyond. Mr. Chair. Dr. Weiss. Senator, it, it's, it was really interesting to me to think about that. We are also the center of origin of sunflower. We did not develop or domesticate sunflower in the United States. The Russians did, and then brought it back and was reintroduced. And it's always, I've always wondered why we didn't pick up on this highly nutritious, high protein, high, high oil nut and develop it in, into, uh, into, into a commercial product. Uh, so we're well on our way to do that, right? So farmers and the industry and the end use industry is very excited about having access to a Midwestern growing nut rather than from Turkey or the Pacific Northwest, right? The, the demand is high. The market is there. All we need to do is de deliver the high quality germplasm. We already have a group of farmers that have a business, uh, Northern uh, Northern uh, uh, Nut Growers uh, uh, Company, and I have a, some of their products here. You can go online and you can buy directly from them today. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Dr. Anderson, or Senator Anderson, do you uh, have any follow-up? Well, thanks for making me a doctor. <laughs> no other questions. A veterinarian, maybe. <laughs> any questions, members? Uh, Thank uh, you. Dr. Wise, uh, thank you for, uh, for, uh, for your testimony. I uh, was wondering, uh, did you change your name uh, to be a professor called Dr. Wise, or did that just happen? I think, it just, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I think it just happened. <laughs> there was a joke in there somewhere. But, uh, Dr. Uh, I got Ro it. <laughs> Rosenwig uh, uh, from General Mills is our next testifier. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wise, for, uh, for, for your testimony. Appreciate that. Mr. Uh, Rosenwig, uh, welcome to our committee. Identify yourself for the record, and uh, please, uh, please go ahead. Um, just trying to be conscientious of time. Uh, if everyone can try to stick to about five, six minutes, that would probably be helpful. Sure, thank welcome. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Steven Rosenzweig. I'm a senior agricultural scientist at General Mills. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, General Mills is a major packaged food manufacturer founded in Minnesota on the banks of the Mississippi River, engaged for over 150 years in the development and production of food products, including ready-to-eat cereals, snack bars, refrigerated dough, and uh, numerous other products. The health of our business depends on the health of the planet and the well-being of farmers who are the foundation of entire food systems. That's why we are on a mission to ensure thriving farmers, communities, and planetary health. It's with this mission and the recognition of the scale and urgency of the issues at hand that we've sought to lead the food industry in research and action for the regeneration of our agricultural systems. But we can't do it alone, and that's why we need your continued support and leadership. And that's why I'm here today to add General Mills' name to the list of companies that strongly supports legislation to increase funding for the University of Minnesota Forever Green Initiative. We've contributed a uh, million dollars of our own uh, funding through philanthrop philanthropic giving to Forever Green and made, made significant commercial investments to make and market products uh, with Kernza, intermediate wheatgrass, including the Cascadian Farm cereal uh, 
that's made from currants that you actually have on your tables there that you, you can try. Uh, and that I eat for breakfast and, and really enjoy it. And the funding uh, that we're discussing today will help grow and stabilize the market for Kernza. We've been contracting for as much Kernza as we can get as a company, and in fact, our demand is much greater than we're often able to procure. To date, our Kernza cereal is in 343 Whole Foods market stores, which represents a 10% increase even since September. We see the potential for more mainstream retailers to carry it as well, and for using Kernza in other products, including granola and snack bars. Given the wide-ranging benefits of enhanced diversity and continuous living cover, from water quality to farm resilience, advancement of the forever green crops also improves the sustainability of all the other crops that we buy from Minnesota, including sugar beets, corn, and wheat. Integrating perennial and winter annual crops into existing farming systems provides growers with new, diverse, and resilient crop options. This has never been more important for Minnesota's farm operators and for businesses like General Mills that rely on the crops that they provide. We strongly support the legislation to fully fund the Forever Green Initiative and look forward to working with the University of Minnesota to make Minnesota the global leader in developing more sustainable, profitable, and diversified cropping systems that improve habitat, water quality, climate, and soil health while boosting our agricultural economy. We urge your support for this important legislation. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rosenwig. Uh, question, Carenza, what, what uh, what's the appetite for uh, General Mills right now uh, to buy it? Do, do you buy a lot of it? Uh, can you get as much as you want? And uh, why? Why? Uh, what do you find in that product different than wheat? Or why would you use that instead of wheat or a different product? Just just as an overall uh, answer. And then other questions, members. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, we in particular are interested in the environmental benefits of it, the water quality aspects, the soil uh, health uh, capabilities. General Mills has a public commitment to advance regenerative agriculture on a million acres, which the principles of regenerative agriculture really include continuous living cover and diversity. And so we see crops like Kernza really helping to uh, help us advance towards our public commitments. But in addition to that, there's a great message for consumers um, you know, we're, we're talking here about uh, Kernza Intermediate Wheatgrass, and that's a, a story that we are really looking forward to t telling to consumers. We have, we're really showcasing that product on the front of the box and, and using that as an opportunity to tell them about the great work that farmers are doing, using Kernza to improve the environment, improve water quality and soil, build their resilience as farmers, um, and it also tastes great. And so the, the nuttiness of the Kernza cereal is something I've um, had an opportunity to try firsthand, even when it was back in product development. And so I know the product developers really see it as a unique product, um, different than, than wheat, but can be used for similar applications, but certainly uh, has those environmental and, and taste benefits too. So, uh, Mr. Rosenwig, does it, do you have a product that, that has that in it specifically? Uh, uh, what, what, would we, what would we know it as? Mr. Chair, it's um, this this cereal right in front of you is the uh, is the Kernza cereal. So um, it's under the one of the General Mills brands is called Cascadian Farm. And if you go into Whole Foods markets around the state or uh, you know around anywhere uh, in the country, you can find uh, Cascadian Farm uh, Climate Smart Kernza Grain cereal uh, is 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 how you can find it there. Okay. So so it's not in the Wheaties, but it's. Uh... Something similar. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Chair, it's, uh, yeah, we, we also make Wheaties, and this is kind of our, uh, yeah, uh, an enhanced version of that, I suppose. Very good. Members, other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Rosenwig. Uh, we sure appreciate you coming and uh, sharing with us and what General Mills is doing. Uh, uh, that's all part of the food chain system, so uh, we appreciate that. Thank uh, you, Doctor, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jones, Dominic Jones from uh, the Mayor of Wyndham. Uh, Senator Dames is your last testifier. Welcome, welcome, Mr. Jones. Identify yourself for our record, and uh, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow members. Uh, I am Dominic Jones. I appreciate the opportunity uh, today to uh, speak uh, in support of the Forever Green Initiative. I applaud uh, Senator Dames for bringing this uh, bill forward, and also. Um, as the agenda said, I'm also a rural water manager, and our system is called the Red Rock Rural Water System. We're in the southwest part of Minnesota. And 
I love to talk about water. Uh, I've been doing this for 38 years in my career of dealing with water sources, uh, water source issues, the distribution and supply to member communities and a population of about 10,000 people in southwest Minnesota. So we have neighbors also. And our neighbor, Lincoln Pipestone Real Water, um, did a pilot program from 2017 to 2019 with Kernza Intermediate Wheatgrass. And they found, and they did it for this reason, because they had nitrate problems in their um, aquifer. This aquifer is 36 square miles that needs wellhead protection. Their test plot was 54 acres. We need more of this in order to facilitate, as Dr. Weiss said, that potential for groundwater remediation of nutrients. So I'm here to attest to that. I'm also here to say that always for real water systems, small communities throughout the area where I put on my hat as mayor, is that even small towns such as Wyndham, uh, where a population of uh, just about 5,000, I think will be over on the 2020 census. So uh, the city of Wyndham has actually benefited by perennial cover and will benefit more on top of their wellhead. Because just recently, we've taken advantage of a situation where we had a, um, a uh, concrete plant sitting on top of our city of Wyndham aquifer. And it's quite a large aquifer, maybe in that four or five square miles, a lake next to it, but a concrete plant sitting right in the middle. It was mined around the edges. And so we made a deal with the owner that moved them to our industrial park. That industrial park now will house the, um, in a secure area that is not born to uh, take up nutrients, uh, will actually be moved to an industrial park. And then we are gonna develop that property and half of that acreage is gonna go into perennial cover, wildflowers, a program that was supported, supported by the Minnesota DNR. So small towns are utilizing perennials also and any way they can find to help water, water and wellhead protection areas. The, the part that I, I am really excited about with a kerns of grass or other perennials is within our own wellhead protection areas, of which we've set aside approximately 160, 160 acres in each one of our three uh, water sources of by easement, conservation easements, uh, that sort of thing. We've worked with uh, Pheasants Forever who then donated the land to Minnesota DNR. We kept 20 acres, they kept 140 for wellhead protection. Those are all great programs, but within our wellhead protection area, we have the uplands where we have rain and it infiltrates and come down into our uh, aquifer. I see this Kerns of Grass, for instance, as a very positive um, an efficient and profitable way that we can stop the nutrients before it gets to our, our aquifers. So our members are going to be happy. What about new members? We've worked with Senator Dames in the past on other projects and many of you have maybe traveled to uh, uh, on a bonding bill to our facility. And we have now are looking for water in another region of our system. High demand for good quality water. So during that search, it would be very advantageous if we could work with producers and say there might be an alternative to just setting aside into CREP. 
that you may be able to have a product that is both financially viable and good for the environment. So I think we've come a long ways. Dr. Weiss and his programs have did an excellent job. Um, we've been watching this for years and, and uh, it's coming to fruition. Um, I applaud you all for uh, hearing this in uh, uh, this committee and I'd be very happy to answer any questions on water quality issues or the city of Wyndham. Members, any questions? Not at this time. Uh, Mr. Jones, thank you for thank making you. the trip in from Wyndham and uh, uh, that thank you. great area of the state. Uh, we appreciate you coming here. So, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, um, members, uh, thank you. any final questions for uh, Senator Dames? Senator Dames, uh, final comment, and then we'll lay the bill over for, uh, for possible inclusion. I'll just leave it end here. And uh, Senator Westrom, uh, I appreciate the opportunity of had you and the committee hear the bill and thank the testifiers for their testimony. And I would appreciate if you would move the bill to lay it over. Uh, this time, uh, members, the bill is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Dames. Oops. Now we'll trade. Senator Western, you have Senate File 3271. Senate File 3271 will be considered and that it will be laid over for possible inclusion. And Senator Western, I understand you have the A1 author's amendment. I, I do, uh, Mr. Chair, if we'd move that, get it in the, the bill in the shape. Members, uh, all those in favor of the A1 author's amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The amendment carries. Senator Westrom, to your bill as amended. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, in the interest of time, I'll get to the witnesses as quick as we can, uh, testifiers. Uh, uh, this bill is a similar topic that we're talking about, but uh, a, a grant or an incentive uh, program to help with the processing and getting that product to a market or process to, uh, to the marketplace and the consumer uh, in the end as a way to help uh, develop some new markets in these specialty crop areas uh, that we've been talking about with the Forever Green. And so uh, with no further ado, Ms. Mr. Chair, members, I'd like to turn it over to our testifiers to uh, tell you a little about uh, their operations or their involvement and interest in uh, helping develop the processing and the new market developments that could come out of uh, products such as Carenza or other crops that we've been hearing about. And uh, from uh, Big Stone County, uh, my constituent, uh, I'd like to have uh, you hear from her. Well, thank you, Senator Westerman. I believe it's Anna. I might get this mispronounced. Schregerl. You're close. Uh, <laughs> Rhymes with Bagel. Representative so. of Minnesota Farmers Union. Yeah. If you would state your name and who you represent for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity. For the record, my name is Ann Schwagel, and I am here to testify in support of Senate File 3271, representing Ms. Minnesota Farmers Union as their vice president, as well as the Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative. I am a grain and livestock producer in Browns Valley, Minnesota. I raise corn, soybeans, oat, kernza, and winter camelina. I also have a few hogs and chickens that I direct market to consumers. In 2020, I joined a group of Kernza and Camelina growers working to organize ourselves to cooperatively pool and market our grain. We have been working to grow these crops both on the landscape and also in the public's eye for their demand and for the final uh, end user. <clears throat> I have been watching the development of Kernza and Camelina closely along with several of the other Forever Green Initiative crops like Pennycress, 
over the past several years. My husband, who farms alongside of me, and I are routinely on the lookout for innovative practices to implement on our operation. This includes incorporating cover crops, reducing our tillage, and planting alternative crops to spread out our rotation. As farmers and entrepreneurs, we are faced with the challenges of innovating and pushing ourselves to respond to new opportunities that arise. We as producers and business operators need to be able to profitably produce grain while also being good stewards to our land and water resources for the next generation of both farmers and consumers. At the same time, farmers also need to get grain moved to the market efficiently for our buyers to access. This bill in front of you, Senate File 3271, is the rare opportunity to respond to multiple challenges all at once. With your support, we can create new opportunities not only for farmers, but even more so for entrepreneurs and businesses as well. The state has invested in the research and development of these crops for Minnesota's farmers, who are very talented at growing and adapting to new cropping systems. The next logical step then is to help bridge the, the gap of death to new markets for growers to sell their crops. As a Kernza and Camelina grower, I see an enormous chance to create economic opportunities for farmers and small business owners to provide innovative, in-demand products, as well as new crops that deliver, <coughs> excuse me, deliver ecosystem services to the state as a whole. Supporting this bill will get us a long way towards many of the goals that we all share. Thank you for your time today, and I am happy to take any questions that you might have, Mr. Chair. Members, any questions for the testifier? Senator Anderson. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Schwagel, um, it mentions in our uh, amendment here um, elderberry, and I don't know if you're familiar with elderberry or not. Uh, my uh, brother right now uh, makes elderberry wine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm asking him to make it better. <laughs> but it, uh, I'm just wondering if you have any experience with that or if anybody uh, who's testifying has experience with the elderberry uh, and where that might be. Uh, we're kind of in a swampy, low area, kind of we're sandy soil, but then it goes to peat ground and then very wet ground in some of the sw swamps and s around the uh, farm. So I'm just a asking you or maybe somebody else uh, about the elderberry that we're going to be hopefully financially presenting. Ms. Schweiger. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am but a lowly grain farmer. I, <laughs> I do not have an experience growing elderberries. Uh, I'm not sure if any of the other testifiers here do um, or where you might be able to access it. It looks like Don Wise has something to say. Don, do you have something to say on elderberry? Go ahead, Dr. Wise. Very quickly. So, Chair, members. Uh, elderberry is an expanding new crop opportunity. We just received um, an $8 million grant in collaboration with the University of Missouri and the Agroforestry Center. Uh, there is a huge emerging demand in the food industry for flavor, preservatives, right, and flavor. Um, so there's a wide range emerging demand in, in uh, uh, um, uh, drinks, you know, the color in, you know, the, you drink the water with a little color in it, the chances are going to be very good. It's going to be coming from elderberry, right? So Thank you, Dr. Weiss. We do have to wrap up here. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Weiss. Thank you. Any further questions, members? The next testifier, Mr. Earhart, would you please go ahead and state your name and who you represent and proceed with your testimony. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate File 3271. My name is Mac Earhart. I'm president of Albert Lee Seedhouse in Albert Lee, Minnesota, which is in District 27. Uh, I'd like to thank and my senator, Senator Dornick, is here today. I'd like to thank him for co-sponsoring this bill. Uh, my company is a third generation uh, seed business here in Minnesota. It was started by my grandfather in 1923. We're a regional seed company. Um, we specialize in the production or the contract production, cleaning, and marketing of small grains, cover crops, uh, as well as organic seed, which is an important part of our business. 
And we are involved in the production of some of the crops that have been discussed today, including the winter barley, hairy vetch, and some of the other um, crops we've been talking about. And again, we're a small company. We have about 40 plus employees, and we ship our seed mostly uh, around the upper Midwest and to the East Coast. So I think most of the folks in this room, and we've heard testimony about this, feel the surge in consumer demand for food that's produced using regenerative agricultural principles. And the way that companies such as mine feel this is it's a huge increase in the demand for cover crop seed uh, and alternative crops such as Kernza, winter camelina, winter barley. And the system knowledge and the agronomic best management practices that are needed in order to grow these crops. So just one, one specific example. So winter rye is the most commonly planted cover crop here in the upper Midwest. When I started in the family business 30 years ago, we sold five or 6,000 bushels a year. Last year, we sold 150,000 bushels. Now, the farmers in the room will think, well, 150,000 bushels isn't a lot, right? But that's one small company, and that's a tremendous increase over the last 30 years, and especially the last six years, in planting of cover crops. And you can multiply that by all the other seed companies in Minnesota who are also selling more and more cover crops every year. And we see a lot of, in a, so that's the, the growth of cover crops. What we also see and feel the demand for new and improved cover crops, like some of the ones that have been discussed today, as well as alternative rotational crops, such as the winter camelina, that could provide farmers with another revenue stream while meeting consumer demand for food that's produced in ways that provide the ecosystem services we've been talking about. So these alternative cropping systems and some of the new crops, such as Kernza and camelina, are very new area of agriculture, and they don't have established supply chains or a lot of agronomic support. So I strongly urge the passage of the Continuous Living Cover Enterprise Bill in order to support these small and medium-sized businesses as they do the research um, and build the systems to support the regenerative agriculture. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Earhart. I think members, instead of starting with the questions right now, I think as ladies is getting in the day, we need to move forward with the rest of the testifiers, and then we'll open up for questions and do the questions all at once. So next we have Mr. Trophus from, uh, uh, if you would state your name, and I probably butchered it, if you would state your name and, and who you represent and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, thank you, members. Uh, my name is John Strophus. You did a very good job uh, getting close there. Um, I live in Hastings, Minnesota. Um, I'm thankful uh, for the opportunity to testify uh, here today. Um, we have a very, uh, I grew up on a very small farm, uh, about 100 acres. We had commercial horse boarding uh, as our primary agriculture function along with hay and forage production. Um, I spent about 19 years uh, in IT uh, working in uh, service industry and came back to the farm after my father passed in 2008 and uh, started looking at our farm to say, you know, how could we diversify and have, uh, you know, compete uh, with larger farm operations and looked uh, significantly at uh, specialty crops. Then in 2016, we were fortunate, uh, Minnesota saw wisdom to allow us to grow industrial hemp. So uh, I'm proud to say I'm the first uh, industrial hemp farmer in Minnesota, and we started Minnesota Hemp Farms. I've given testimony on uh, hemp as an alternative foods crop, and we're 99% focused on uh, on uh, hemp for food production, and now I believe we're the largest U.S. Uh, supplier of bulk hemp food ingredients. Um, so uh, in 2016, we started that. We also started a brand called Field Theory, and the purpose of that brand was to take uh, bulk hemp food products into consumer packaged goods, and we're uh, in national um, pursuit right now of brand representation in that area. Uh, the reason that is relevant to, to testimony today is because our business has shifted uh, into an ingredients company where we've been looking uh, and working with other unique crops. Uh, there was testimony today about sunflower. Um, we now grow sunflower uh, on our farm uh, here, which is abnormal for the area. And we work directly with brands uh, to supply them uh, sunflower. Incidentally, our family farming operation is now about eight to 900 acres. Um, I partner farm with a friend of mine in that business. But for field theory, uh, we are focused on regenerative agriculture um, as a brand. Uh, we work with other manufacturers uh, and suppliers um, and really have worked to build out a 
fairly dynamic uh, supply chain in many different crops. We also sell uh, rye as a cover crop. We sold significant amount of uh, planting seed for rye, also milling rye. And the point is, is that we are um, invested in regenerative agriculture as part of our brand. And one of the challenges um, with, um, with doing this is the investment that's required, especially as a small company, a small brand, to take a new ingredient. Um, you know, we've had experience with hemp. We've looked at, um, you know, different uses of different crops. We're very interested in Kernza, uh, Camelina uh, as well, to bring that into our brand. And I think uh, this bill will uh, be very helpful to us uh, to explore and give us some other resources to really take um, uh, this, uh, to create a demand for the farming side. So I, uh, and before you today, with really two hats on, as a producer, I'd like to be growing Kernza and some of these alternative crops and implementing them in our cover cropping system um, on our farm. But then I would also like to have uh, a direct market for them and use them um, as, a, as a processor. We work with uh, a network of growers, a network of uh, tool processors, and our uh, endeavors are uh, fairly lofty to have uh, both bulk ingredient sale as well as consumer packaged goods containing some of these new and exciting crops. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Perez, if you would proceed to state your name and who you represent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fabulous. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Lauren Fittes. I'm the chief of staff at Puris Foods. Puris, our organization works across the supply chain. So meaning we work with farmers, we manufacture the products that we buy back from those farmers, and then we work with large CPG organizations to then create that final product accessible to consumers. Consumer packaged goods are increasingly marketing environmental and sustainability advantages to gain momentum in the marketplace. Matter of fact, our team is at Expo West in Anaheim, California this week where lots of CPG organizations are showcasing their sustainable uh, products. Forever Green initiative, their crops fit squarely into the model that the food manufacturers like ourselves are looking for in order to meet consumer needs. Crops that deliver nutrition, nutritious value while improving soil and water quality can drive a premium on the marketplace if their production, if the production, if their production, excuse me, and the story around the way that they were grown and made is transparent and sustainable. Um, our organization Pures proves that sustainable food and agricultural model is possible. Um, the way that we did so was commercializing a pea protein, leveraging yellow field peas, which are nitrogen fixating, meaning they give more of the soil than they take um, and help farmers mitigate the amount of fertilizer that they need to put down on their property. Over the last 20 years, our organization has invested in the breeding, the production, and the processing infrastructure, as well as the market development of both yellow field peas and pea protein. Um, we're also thrilled to announce the commission of our second pea protein processing processing facility, which is located in Dawson, Minnesota, District 16, which brought over 90 jobs to that community, um, which before that facility had been mothballed and had um, been retired. And that facility also helps bring online an increasing number of acres. We're looking at pea production into the hundreds of thousands. It's, it's a huge facility, about 200,000 square feet. I always tell people it's like the Taj Mahal of pea protein facilities. <laughs> uh, peas are an example of crops that can add diversity as well as soil and water health improvements to Minnesota farmers. Um, the Forever Good in, um, Initiative is spearheading the development of other crops that can transform the economic potential of Minnesota farmland by delivering sustainable, um, nutritious um, ecosystem services and product market fit for these new consumers. Um, investment into connections between farmers, manufacturers, and brands is critical for the success of these new crops. We all know that simply growing a crop doesn't equal success. Success is when we have a thriving supply chain that can, can transform the crop into its final form, whether that be food, feed, or fuel, um, and create more value per acre than we were able to do before. Uh, the Forever Green um, organization understands this and is considering the holistic success of the crops in an effort to, um, in efforts by including both processing and marketing, marketing development um, in this bill. So critical for the adoption of these crops into the marketplace. And thank you for your time and allowing me to testify. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Ms. Ms. Perez. Uh, we certainly appreciate the testi testimony. Members, any questions? Any questions or further discussions? Senator Westrom, real short comments on your bill. Short. <laughs> short, very short. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, I think uh, this has been uh, very educational, uh, helpful to uh, understand uh, the, the whole picture of the forever green, uh, the cropping, how it may mix into uh, traditional crops, uh, and in some cases uh, be a new alternative crop with buffer strips and other things, wellhead protection that we talk about. Uh, certainly some areas we need to figure out a little bit more targeted, I believe, in how the, the dollars, if any, could be best targeted to help uh, make that product uh, get from the field to uh, the processor to the market. And so uh, that's how, uh, a big part of why we wanted to start with this hearing and uh, welcome your uh, input, your suggestions, as we uh, try to uh, figure out the best ways to help advance uh, agricultural opportunities in the state of Minnesota. And uh, this is a piece of that puzzle. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Westrom and members. Uh, we're getting near to the end of the day, and I just want to thank all the testifiers that came in today and shared their information with us. And Senator Westrom, Senate, 30, Senate file 3271 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Members, with no further business become before the committee, the Committee on Agriculture, Rural Development, Finance, and Policy is now adjourned.